people use the word podunk or you know hillbilly or whatever because it's out in the sticks. They can say whatever we want, but we, we have an amazing community. You'll go months without thinking about it all, and it just kind of slaps you in the face. 911, what is your emergency? There is a house on 5.30 and a big slide, and it is covering the road. I just yelled out, oh God, no, and then it went black. Are there any injuries? Yes, there's people yelling for help. <laughs> 10 years, it's still raw. I might need a minute. People are going to get the idea that I know how to cook. You don't want that. We'll have days where we'll have three calls in one day, and then we'll have two weeks without a call. I didn't know anything about being a chief. It's a small community. There's not really like a working up through the system. Uh, my name is Willie Harper. I am the fire chief of the Oso Fire Department. I've been the fire chief since 2012, which was two years before the landslide. There's a combined fire and everything's gone. The houses are gone. We watched hundreds of trees come falling. I'm on a steep post road on Highway 530. 10.45, the call came in for a roof in the middle of the road. Uh, kind of a strange call to get, uh, but it wasn't a real big call as far as what I could tell on the pager. And there has been a huge landslide and it's pushed the house all the way across the road. I was thinking to myself, if there's a roof on the road, I might need to cone off the road. You never know who's around on Saturdays. They're all volunteers, so they got family stuff. Basically, it's for a single engine response that they have water in the roadway and that a part of a building. And so it's like, okay, a little slide, something has blocked the highway. Wow, it's really flooding. And as I pulled over the hill and down into where the road was blocked, nothing really made sense. Like there is a uh, structure out in the middle of 530. We'll be investigating. I had recognized it from a barn that was off to the south of the highway. We're getting on the radio and asking questions and not, not really getting any information. We're hearing um, cries from somewhere over there. Are you guys hearing them for your end? Uh, I'm Sergeant Rocky Oliphant with the Washington State Patrol. I was the first trooper on scene of the Oso landslide. So I was on I-5. I was actually checking for speeders. Oh, so I was the only one headed out there. And so I came around a corner. I'll tell you that when I arrived on that scene, it was an overwhelming feeling for me. I tried to get over my, my radio to tell my dispatcher what was going on. He's going out for uh, search and rescue helicopters. Uh, this is a major uh, event here, and uh, we need additional resources. You could start hearing on the voices, well, where are you? We don't see you. I want you to go to the end of Whitman Road and see if you can see the people that are trapped on the other side of the water. Back and forth, back and forth, and all of a sudden you kind of realize, well, if they're not able to see or make connection to each other physically, this is much bigger than any of us realized. And at one point, I stepped on a log that gave way, and I went in and pulled that back out and just drenched in mud. You know, in the moment, you're just trying to do everything you can to help. It was at that point that we heard a guy yell from the mud, uh, hey, there's a baby out here. And we all kind of looked at each other and we're like, I'm saying out one victim, appears to be about a six month old baby. Uh, red. One of my buddies that was there, a civilian, he said, well, I'm, I'm going in to help. And I looked at one of the other firefighters and said, well, if he's going in, we're going in. And so we started into the mud. We've got a few victims up here. Could you guys uh, try to coordinate some backboards or stokes from that end? They got halfway out into there and they heard a baby crying. And at that point, I started taking pieces of plywood off of a house, roofing off of a house and just ripping it off and trying to make a path for them to safely get back. Okay, as far as we can tell, we only have one more victim out here. She's currently trapped and we're trying to extricate. I think that's probably the loneliest I've ever felt. I remember every single detail of it. I, like it was yesterday, I heard a rumble. And so then I looked out our front door and our neighbor's chimney was coming straight at us and all I could do was turn. Who do we got? She was under a couch in a tree. 
and the tree was in like 10 to 12 feet of mud. One of the guys reached in and grabbed her baby from her and he was, he was turning blue. We had the couch broken around us. I noticed that there was like a hole beside us. I tried to pull him through the hole because I thought if I, heaven forbid if I don't make it, and I put him outside, they'll find him. I don't know, I just sat there praying that if he did go, it wouldn't be in front of me. One of the guys <clears throat> that was there with me was uh, a logger buddy of mine from Darrington. A logger by the name of Quinn Nations. And he literally crawled inside this cave and cut the tree away from her. And I didn't even see his face. I just saw a lot of hair. I owe him a lot. He is the only person that really kept me sane that day or like tried to calm and comfort me. They had to resuscitate Duke at the scene. If they really would have waited a little longer, he'd be, he wouldn't be here. Come here, Duke. Have a seat, my friend. Hi, buddy. Hey. Okay, so make sure he looks so, not not towards the sun, but you have to listen to direction, okay? My name is Duke. I am 10 years old, and I am in mostly fourth grade. Yeah, I'm in fourth okay. grade. What book is this? It's been really hard between his surgeries and his TBI. Keep going. He lost vision for a while. That <laughs> boy. So he has optic nerve damage now. He has pretty much daily seizures from his head injury. It's been like that for years in my head. It's been like, how am I going to get this away from me? Duckies. I know a duck call. <laughs> I think he kind of defines himself as, I was Duke from the land side. I was baby Duke. As much as we try, not fight it or hide it, it's just, I don't want him to be a victim forever. Yeah, I never want to be a victim. Well, you're not. I mean, I, mean, I guess we are, but you're good now. Right? Oh. Look, your duck call worked. I think why every day? I think why am I here every day? I have a lot, a lot of survivor's guilt. Okay, come here, Q. Do you want me to hold you or are you good? I'm good. So Quinn was named after Quinn Nations, who was one of the loggers that sat with me the day of the slide. I felt like it was a no-brainer to name little Q after big Q. He's so good with Duke, though. He, if Duke has a seizure, he'll like run straight to him. No matter what, I noticed that God would take care of the ones we knew. I just whisper it to God to take care. We had no idea the spread of it or the depth and the magnitude. The other guy that was firefighter that was with me crawled up on top of some trees and he said, and I said, what do you see out there? And he goes, nothing. I'm like, what do you mean nothing? And what about the houses or the highway? And he goes, there's nothing. At some point we finally figured out that we're, we're about a mile apart. And that, that's when it kind of made us realize how big this thing was. When we came over the ridge into the North Fork Stillaguamish Valley, 530 wasn't visible, it was covered. We're looking at a catastrophic event here. Uh, we've got Whitman Road that has been taken out by a slide. It completely dammed the river. Downstream was virtually dry. We didn't see anybody on our first pass. There's this kind of panic setting in, and the scale of this is starting to make sense. But you know, hey, we got work we have to do. We 
had our moving map so we could see we were right over the neighborhood and there was nothing uh, man-made that we could see sticking up. We made one pass downstream over the pile and we didn't see anybody and we turned around and came back up and that's when we spotted the two ladies on the rooftop. As I'm going down the hook, I realize that this, the roof section they're on is floating. We're working in the middle of a lake, basically. The water was still coming in. Everything out there had exploded. The mud was still coming in. My house had been destroyed. A whole tree had landed on Yeti, my friend who was with me. I have her. We got the, uh, the Dutch woman up and out of there, came back down, hooked up. Robin, you know, she's a Native American pastor, and she had a, a painting of this Indian warrior that she had lugged up to the roof. But I told him, it's very important to me. It's a Cherokee night warrior. It was clearly meaningful, and I told her, you can't, you can't take that. I needed that painting. That's all I can say about it. I really needed it. Slacking, slack, slack. So we got her up, and when they came to extract me again, I just grabbed the painting and took it up with me. It was very satisfying to at least have that one piece of her life there to give to her. I felt good about that after it was done. For Randy to go down for that painting was a big deal. I was so grateful to him for that. And if the helicopters hadn't come, I don't know what would have happened to us. The slide wiped away any sort of security Robin Youngblood felt living in Oso. She moved several times trying to find a place that brought her some peace. She finally found it here, just outside of Asheville, North Carolina. They call this the Blue Ridge Mountains, and at certain times of day, those mountains back there will look blue. Basically, I've spent the last 10 years trying to find safety again. This guy, he's the one that came up in the mudslide. I just cleaned the mud off of it when I moved here. My kids wouldn't even let me clean it off. It signified everything that happened. Will I ever be completely at peace? I don't know. I've been a warrior all my life. I had to fight my way out of that mudslide and through the next years. And maybe I'm still fighting a few things. Winter time, they don't lay as much. There you go, carrot yum yum. It's kind of like a, a, a dream job. And we got property that goes all the way down to the river. When our pagers went off, and as I'm listening to the radio, I knew within minutes that it was something really bad and when I got there it was like a scene out of a horrible movie. Like it wasn't real, it was like a dream. I go, that house is gone, that one's gone. I counted four houses that I knew that were supposed to be there. I have eyes on three patients. I need swift water gear out here. If I have a partner I can get to the patient that's seriously injured. He basically has one arm amputated at the present time. The river wasn't flowing. The water was backing up. If you got propane floating on the ground, if you have what's left of houses, you have cars, or just piles of mud and trees. And then we were out there and we just kept digging. I mean, there are times where I was near my breaking point. And then I looked out there and I see two people standing on what used to be a house. And I kind of talked to them back and forth. Are you hurt? And they said, no, I'll get help as soon as I can. Just stay where you are and uh, I'll get people out there as soon as I get enough manpower. And then I turned back around. And this woman who's covered in mud, a little boy next to her is covered in mud. And they said, can you help us? And I said, come with me. I recommend whatever manpower we have to start evacuating from the upstream side of the slide. The reports that were coming in from our, the air assets in Snohomish County were that that community was effectively and unfortunately gone. The river's kind of backing up onto it. When a state hydrogeologist contacted me and said that it was going to, in his words, break loose and destroy everything in its path. If we can't, and it's a catastrophic a release all at once, it could create substantial problems downstream through those communities. And our initial uh, 
decision was to evacuate the community. Don't take any chances at that point. About 11 miles up the road is Darrington, a small logging town with really only one main road. The landslide had Highway 530 blocked in this direction, and the only real detour is about two miles up the highway here into the mountains. The people of Darrington were essentially cut off. The people are scared because, you know, they don't know what's going to happen, you know. I mean, we're trapped here in Darrington pretty much. And in those first days, it was all about rescue. Bringing our friends, our family, and our neighbors home. The flags tell the story in Darrington, a town with an unwavering spirit. It's people standing tall in a crushing tragedy. It's a small town. The great things about small town Folks dug in, bringing food, bringing offers of beds. You know, at this time, we didn't know how many people we needed to account for. We understood at that moment in time that this was not going to be a local event, it was not going to be a state event, that it was going to be an international event. We have people that are yelling for our help. Uh, we're going to take extreme risks to try to get them out of there tonight. We did, uh, we did recover uh, two uh, additional fatalities today. Uh, that brings our fatality rate to 16. Many of the people missing were on Steelhead Drive, where Navy Commander L. John Regal Bruggy lived with his wife. No word yet on baby Sanoa, but they know she has to be somewhere in the debris. Tom and Marcy Satterley. Her niece, Delaney Webb, is one of the many that are listed as missing. We're still in a rescue mode at this time. However, I want to let everyone know that the, the situation is, is very grim. We would come back home at night and you'd get up in the morning and you'd go back in. It just seemed to go on and on and on. There was just massive logs, whole stacked, and we're cutting them from just doing the grid search, you know, where we're going down. Well, the houses, some of them were pancake. You would pull apart the roof and then there was a room underneath that. And then when we, we saw a body, young guy, he just said, he looked at him and he said, that's my dad. His son is out there as a civilian on the debris pile, and it's his father. And we get all away from him, we stop cleaning up because we're going to let this family have a moment with their loved one. I'm a man of faith, and, and I believe in miracles. And you've all reported on incidents worldwide where these things can turn on a dime and somebody can be found. I don't know if we're gonna be able to do this. Stuff. Buddy, we can stop anytime you want, okay? My captain at the time, Seth, he showed up and he's like, what's going on? And, and I said, I don't, I don't know, everything seems to be gone. The houses are gone, everything's gone. And, and he said, All right. where's my family? My wife and my daughter, or my granddaughter are out there and my dog, where are they at? I'm like, I, I don't know, I, I don't know. And then it starts to sink in. Like you need to stop. We'll give away. this a shot. I get, I get, I'll tell you quite honestly, I couldn't speak her name, couldn't talk about her for five years. Because it hurt so bad. During the slide, I lost my wife, Christina, and my granddaughter, Sonoma Violet. Ten, ten years later, it still hurts. And then it starts to sink in that you know, there's people missing that we know. And I think at that point, it was like, shh, you know, kind of slapped you in the face. So they found her a few days later, and I got a phone call from, uh, I believe it was Chief Harper. Willie had said that they had found her. So it was a relief, but uh, it's not the relief you want. That moment with Seth must have been heart-wrenching. Yeah. I might need a minute. Um, probably one of the worst moments of my life.
after searching a, a, a very large area of that debris field on foot, uh, we didn't find anybody alive. There was no sign of life. And I had a sense that uh, we, uh, we're we going to have some hard news here. If it had not happened on a Saturday morning, there wouldn't have been nearly as many people lost. That makes me sad, the what ifs. Why did it have to be that day? These individuals come in up to waist deep in mud that they've been going through. Um, they've been digging through stuff. They've seen things that most people shouldn't, I mean, people shouldn't have to see. At least a couple of months of going out and, and looking. Our crews are weary and they're tired and they're doing a fantastic job out there. We were so determined to find everybody. You couldn't let yourself get tired because you had to keep going because we were going to find everybody. Eventually, we did. Where I'm standing now really looks up the throat of the slide. I'm Glenn Farley. I'm a retired reporter for King TV. I was one of the first reporters to work this incident. At one point, we actually went in there with the USGS team. They didn't know if more wasn't going to come down. Oh, my name is David Montgomery, and I'm a professor of geomorphology here at the University of Washington. It was a surprising event. I mean, the idea that we'd have big landslides in Western Washington, that's not a surprise. One that would go that far, that fast, that was a surprise. It was essentially a reactivation of a, a slide that had failed before, but this time it went further, faster presumably due to all the rain that we had. I mean, that was an incredibly wet month. Add rain, heavy rain this month, double the average, more than 15 inches. The weather was clearly a factor here. That tr triggered the debris avalanche. And then the second piece of the hill fell down, essentially rotated, well, essentially rotated or collapsed down into the hole left by that first piece. And they described it as like an entire row of semis that would have been traveling at that kind of speed mowing over everything in its path. They told us it's just going to stabilize that slope. I call it engineering failure. Those houses had not been green lighted. Those people would be here today. Those families would not be living what they have to live with today. One of the agreements that we struck with the authorities was when they f located a body that all the filming would stop. There would be a, a whistle, a horn that went off. That happened when we were back in there. And these people didn't have a chance. And that's why we really need to be smart about the geology going forward in this state. Every year on the anniversary, um, I pause, I pray, I cry, and you would think that time and distance would help. And, and the thing is, it's never going to help because I've, I've seen the big and the bad and the ugly in my career. I've seen everything, everything you can imagine, and I had not seen that. It's like there's a scar there. It's always going to be a visual for us. And honestly, I always think of the people every time we drive through there. What we're looking at is we have a heart built into the field. I saw away and said, I love you. I imagine this stays here forever. I hope so, yeah, as long as I'm here. As long as I'm here. Oh, so strong. Mm. I think for a lot of people, it means honor. It means love, you know, to memorialize. It was a horrible thing to see. And 10 years later, it's still there. It's a memorial now and should be, but nobody's moving back in there. These are people we knew. People worked at the library, the grocery store. We worked together as kind of like a team. I guess maybe it brought the people closer. There you go. It was just that, you're all so strong. Yeah, we're strong. We're going to make it through this. We're going to overcome this. We're going to do the best that we can. I see Duke, and I see oh so strong. Quinn is oh so strong. Hey, Rita. Hi, Will. 
You good? How are you? Hi, didn't recognize the car out there. <laughs> I think it did show a lot of people outside our community that we're a strong community. I think it just means that we still have not given up. We're still fighting. Our valley still oh so strong. There's a very comforting calmness out there. It's permanently a part of us, good or bad.